on today's show, the Hawks go up to Portland and compete valiantly without Trey Young in the lineup. But on this night, it was not the offense that was the problem without Trey, as it usually is. It was the defense that was the issue for the Hawks for the second straight night. And they have now lost four of the last five games. We'll have a full breakdown of the game and everything else coming up. You are Locked On Hawks, your daily Atlanta Hawks podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team, every day. Hello, friends. Welcome to episode 1401 of the Locked On Hawks podcast. I am your host, Brad Rowland, coming to you deep into the night on a Monday into Tuesday. And today's show is brought to you by FanDuel Sportsbook, the official sportsbook of the Locked On Podcast Network. Make every moment more. Visit FanDuel.com slash Locked On today to get started. And I also want to encourage you at the top of the podcast to make us your first listen here at Locked On Hawks each and every day, wherever you get your podcasts. That, of course, includes places like Apple Podcasts and Spotify, as well as YouTube on the video side. And today's show, we'll be diving into what became a 129-125 to 125 loss for the Hawks up in Portland. It was a valiant effort in some ways because the Hawks played this game without Trey Young, who is obviously the Sun, Moon, Stars franchise player for Atlanta. It was the first game of a five-game road trip for the Hawks, and unfortunately their fourth loss in the last five games. They're now below 500 again for the first time in a few games, and uh, not a whole lot of great, uh, great vibes coming out of this one, despite the fact the Hawks did play pretty well in some areas. Also, the Hawks have not won in Portland since February 13th of 2017. That is almost six years. There was not a single player on the roster now that was on the team then. That includes John Collins, who's been around for a long time. He was drafted four months later, so it's been a long time. Obviously, some weird circumstances in there as well, but anytime you don't beat a team on the road for six years, that's not great. And the Hawks only led in this game once for a grand total of 10 seconds. The Hawks were down by essentially single digits for... I don't know, two and a half quarters consecutively in this game. They just hung around and hung around. And honestly, that was to their credit. They could have faded and they didn't. So that's a, a bit of a positive spin on this game, but also not able to go over the hump down the stretch. That was It was definitely competitive in crunch time. It was tied a couple of times. Hawks were right there, but uh, in the end, not quite enough firepower. As we did on um, our last episode, actually, on Saturday night into Sunday, we're going to try something different on this podcast, at least for a little while now, and kind of lead with the big picture takeaways from this game. So the biggest one pretty obviously, is that the defense was not good enough in this contest. And that's very obvious on the scoreboard. I get all that. But the main theory behind how the Hawks can survive on a night without Trey Young in the past has almost always been that defense should improve. Now, Trey's been better defensively in the last few weeks than he has been for most of his career. I will definitely acknowledge that. But in general, you would not have expected the Hawks to get into an offense first shootout and actually be able to hold, sort of hold up without Trey. But that actually happened in this game. We'll get to the opposite in a second. But if you told me what the Hawks would do in this game, both scoring and efficiency and shooting and everything else, I would have told you there was like a 90% chance, maybe even higher than that, for the Hawks to win this game. But unfortunately, they wasted the offensive effort because they could not get stops throughout the night. The Blazers had a 139 offensive rating in this game. If you're not a huge efficiency person, uh, I would just say the league leader basically is like 118, 119, something like that. And uh, this is well beyond that. Portland's a good offensive team, for sure. Damian Lillard is a star on offense, no question about that. And look, you have to credit the Blazers for making a ton of shots. And I said this throughout the game multiple times on Twitter, but this is a situation where both things were true. The Hawks were not very good defensively in this game, and Portland was hot. And that is also a, a bad combination, obviously, if you are Atlanta. But just broadly speaking, you can't really expect to overcome a 139 defensive rating in a full game, especially on the road against a pretty decent team. Portland shot 54% from the floor in the game and 19 of 40 from three. Now, that, that number at the end is obviously the problem. And, and look, it was very similar to the game on Saturday where the Hawks ran into a buzzsaw of the Clippers who already have really big talents in Kawhi and PG. And also, they made a bunch of threes. This is kind of the same thing. Damian Lillard didn't, like, go totally nuts in this game. He had 42 points, yes, uh, but he wasn't, like, just, you know, he had 60 the other day. He wasn't just completely going insane. It was that... A lot of other guys made shots. Jeremy Grant made four threes. Every time he's made five threes. Not as little was two for two from three-point range. So it wasn't just a one, a one guy barrage. Also, they got to the line 27 times, made 24 of them, only eight turnovers. And that's what you kind of can't afford when the team is shooting as well as they were to not turn them over as well was a problem. The one strength the Hawks did have defensively in this game, which is definitely notable, was on the glass. But the Blazers just kept making so many shots that it wasn't quite as big of a strength as it probably could have been if the Hawks were getting a little bit more in terms of uh, forcing misses. Um, one of the issues defensively was that the Hawks were trying to overcome the non-DeJounte Murray minutes by playing 
AJ Griffin and Bogdanovich together. And that is not really tenable defensively, especially when the Blazers, I don't know if it was on purpose or if it was just their normal rotation, they were playing Dame in those minutes. So the Hawks were kind of, not all of them, but the Hawks were definitely uh, asking themselves basically to get stops against Dame while playing two porous defensive wings at the same time. And look, Murray struggled defensively. He was awesome on offense in this game. I will definitely say that. I'll, I'll come back to that in just one second. Uh, but DeJounte on the ball defensively has not been playing great this year. It's not as if Aaron Holiday or Trent Forrest, who played in this game actually, were going to be able to overcome that by themselves defensively. So it wasn't the same as the Clippers loss in that it was a very different personnel situation. Portland is much more guard-driven, whereas the Clippers are much more wing and forward-driven. But the same sentiment applies that I talked about on after that game on Saturday and Sunday, that the Hawks just could not get enough stops along the way. It was because in part of the opponent shooting and also because the Hawks just could not execute point of attack defense, especially was porous throughout this game. Um, elsewhere, DeJounte Murray did the job that he was asked to do and really required to do in this spot. I have pointed out a few different times this season. And it's not really the fall of DeJounte, which I always want to make, sh- make very clear. DeJounte's having a decent season. He's not playing poorly or anything like that. But the Hawks have been basically unable to score when Trey is off and DeJounte is on. The numbers paint that picture. That's not my opinion. That is the numbers. Uh, the Hawks have a brutal like second percentile offense when Trey leaves the floor with DeJounte on this year. That's just that's just the facts. But part of the theory about getting DeJounte Murray was that on a night like this, when Trey is out or like Trey has foul trouble or Trey rolls an ankle or whatever, you can rely on DeJounte Murray as a number one shot creator in this game. He lived up to that. He was excellent in this game. It was a career best night for him. And he was the biggest engine of that offensive performance that was so good for the Hawks in this game. He ended up with a career high 40 points. Yes, DeJounte's career high is only 39 coming in. So congratulations to him for a new mark there. Also eight rebounds, six assists, and importantly, zero turnovers. So that's a borderline perfect game on the, on the box score for DeJounte Murray. Uh, inside the arc, he was just he was pretty average, actually probably below average, eight, eight of eighteen on twos. That's not great, but he was five of seven from three. That was big in this game and got to the line nine times, made all nine. In fact, he made seven straight free throws in the fourth quarter that were very important that we'll come back to later on in the game. Um, still has a tendency, I will say, to settle too much offensively. That's even more magnified with Trey off the floor. But Dejounte carried a huge load in this game. He was awesome. Three point shooting was big. His uh, his creation late in the game was big. And uh, look, he was kind of the only guy on the available roster tonight that could create his, create his own shot with regularity and was great for other people as well. And uh, he did a good job in this game. So shout out to DeJounte. I mean, obviously it would have been a bigger deal. I think nationally if, if the Hawks had won this game, but he had a career best night and that should not go overlooked. And then finally the offense was again, more than good enough to win for Atlanta in this game. You would expect again, that the Hawks would be much worse, not just worse, much worse without Trey on offense. And that's been the case all season long. Again, the Hawks have been like nine or 10 points per hundred possessions worse with Trey off the floor on offense. That is a staggering number over a pretty large sample size, but part of that's Trey being awesome. Part of that is the fact that the Hawks only have the depth in the rough situation to overcome Trey's absences. But Atlanta had a 136 offensive rating. That is a number that you just would take and run and hide with anytime, even when you have Trey, much less without him. Um, The Hawks didn't shoot that well from two-point range, actually, in this game. Only 5 of 17 on long twos, only 13 of 33 on all twos outside of the rim area. That's still too many attempts, by the way, in the mid-range. Even tonight, when I I start to complain about that because the Hawks made every shot from other other places, but still rough there. But 13 of 30 from three, that's a heck of a number there for for, uh, for the non-Trey Hawks. 43% from three in this game. 24 of 30 at the line. Yes, they made some – sorry, they missed some late in the game that were important that we'll come back to but still a pretty productive night at the line for the Hawks and only seven turnovers and 17 offensive rebounds. That is a huge number. Now, some of those offensive rebounds were the Capella, Moses Malone, throw it to yourself variety, but still the Hawks took 15 more shots than the Blazers did and shot well and still didn't win because Portland was that good shooting wise, but the Hawks really were awesome on offense in this game. Portland is a pretty bad defensive team that has to be noted and emphasized for at least part of why this happened. But the Hawks really did do everything they possibly could have done on offense in this game. And it just wasn't quite enough to overcome the defense and all the liability stuff there. So we'll get into all of what transpired in this game coming up, as well as like kind of the uh, the game flow, my overall takeaway, some rotation thoughts. Uh, and my, why I, I did not like at all Jalen Johnson not playing in this game. We'll come back to that later on as well. But before we get to that, a word from our sponsors on today's show. 
This year, the only app that you need at your Super Bowl party is FanDuel, America's number one sports book. We're very excited about FanDuel as our new sports betting partner on the Lothon Podcast Network. And if you're new to the party with FanDuel, that is even better. They have tons of great features that make sports betting both fun and easy. Download FanDuel right now. You can bet on Super Bowl 57 with a no-sweat first bet with FanDuel. Get up to $3,000 in bonus bets if your first bet doesn't win on FanDuel. And they have all kinds of bet options over at FanDuel that includes money lines and point spreads and totals, even a better who's going to score the first, first touchdown out in Arizona for that Super Bowl. It's going to be an awesome matchup as well. The Chiefs and the Eagles meeting in Arizona for the biggest title in the NFL, of course, and the matchup between Patrick Mahomes and Jalen Hurts with everything on the line, stars everywhere, and that should be a very, very fun game. This protects to be quite close, actually, if you look at the betting market at this point in time. If it'll, if it'll force back... Sportsbook app is safe, secure, and easy to use. And best of all, get your winnings paid instantly with FanDuel. Join FanDuel today at FanDuel.com slash locked on to claim your no sweat first bet on Super Bowl 57. This is FanDuel.com slash locked on. Make every moment more with FanDuel, official sportsbook partner of the NFL. Okay, and we'll get into sort of the way the uh, the game flowed on this Monday into Tuesday. The Blazers came in actually pretty cold in the standings recently. They lost four of their previous six. And after a hot start, they have been uh, certainly a pretty unimpressive overall team. But they are very good at home, a plus 4.3 net rating coming in at the Moda Center in Portland. So that's notable. Uh, the Hawks, of course, have been struggling as well. And Trey being out in this game, just for the record, he had right ankle soreness. And uh, he was ruled out before the game pretty comfortably. Um, I think Bob Ruffin says as well, but I was told it, was a, it happened in the fourth quarter on Saturday against the Clippers. I don't think it's like a serious ankle issue because he was listed as questionable in this game, but we'll have more on that if we need to going into Wednesday. The Blazers, though, got some good news. They actually got Josh Hart and Yusuf Nurkic back in this game, both starting guys for the Blazers. So basically the injury report went about as badly as the Hawks could have got, could have had it happen in the last hour before tip-off. And as a result, our friends at FanDuel made the Hawks five-and-a-half-point underdogs in this game. Uh, so they covered the spread. There's that. Um, the Hawks were already going to be underdogs, albeit slightly without with Trey in the lineup. So – I saw some people before Trey was ruled out saying that this is a game that the Hawks like, you know, had to win or should win. All this. And, and I get it because Portland's not great, but the Hawks were going to be underdogs either way with Trey or without Trey. So that's at least worth keeping in mind for some context and how, I guess how mad you should probably be in this game. The Hawks did start Aaron Holiday. Um, I wouldn't love that in most matchups, to be honest, but I didn't mind it here because Portland, almost as much as any team in the league, relies on two pretty small offensive creator guards and that's Aaron Holiday's specialty is defending small guards like Dame like Simons and Holiday uh, as, as long as he's playing with DeJounte doesn't kill your offense like he's a three and D guy basically as I've been talking, saying for a while now but uh, I didn't mind that I know and by the way I'm not saying he's better than AJ Griffin I know I know that or bogey even but matchup wise I always understood it because it allowed the Hawks to kind of be more natural on defense in this game but Portland was making shots early and often uh, rotationally, they waited a little bit longer than usual to make a sub in this game. Bogey came in as the first sub with like six and a half minutes gone in the game. That also happened to coincide with Dame leaving the floor, which I'm sure was not a coincidence at that point. They brought in Griffin and Okongwe after that. And then, uh, by the way, Murray and Hunter played the entire first and third quarters. That's not normal for those guys at all, so I wonder how that kind of affected things. The Hawks took their first lead of the game and really their only lead of the game Um after about 10 minutes uh, and that lasted about 10 seconds. So like the Hawks just never were able to go over the line in this one. Uh, they called timeout right after that. Uh, the Hawks didn't score for the last two minutes and 12 seconds of the, of the first quarter. And it was a 9-0 run by the Blazers. That was their first kind of break it open kind of kind of run in the game. And the Hawks were down by eight at the end of the first quarter as a result of that. Offensively, they were just fine, but defensively only forced one turnover. Portland was shooting the ball very well as they were the entire way. And then there was a rotation tweak in the second quarter that I want to touch on now. So Trent Forrest started the second quarter and the fourth quarter in this game and played 10 minutes. Now I have been pretty high on Trent Forrest as an option this year. And even I was surprised by this. And it's, it's worth noting. It was his first rotation appearance since December 28th. That was also a game that Trey missed. So I think maybe that's just one of the things that Nate likes to go to is Trent Forrest when, when Trey is out. I don't think that's terrible, but I will say, uh, I guess I'll just do it now. They did not play Jalen Johnson in this game, and I disagree with that. You know, I am not going to be one that comes on and yells and screams about Jalen not playing enough or AJ not playing enough, just willy-nilly. I've kind of pushed back a little bit, at least with some context on Hawks fans for trying to be really, really angry about Jalen's usage in particular in recent days. But 
I don't like that. I don't like Jalen not playing in this game. I don't like Jalen not playing really much at all recently. That is something that I don't really agree with. I think he would have been useful as a point of attack, not point of attack necessarily, but more of a versatile, athletic, rangy defender. Um, he has weaknesses too, no question about that. Jalen's not a perfect player at this point, but I would have liked to see him play more, in particular because he can give you some more creation with DeJounte off the floor in particular in this game. So I would have gone to Jalen. I didn't like that at all. I'll be very clear about that. Now, I thought Forrest was fine. I thought he played fine. Now, it's a little bit confusing that the Hawks only played Aaron Holiday 15 minutes and played Forrest 10 minutes. And, you know, generally speaking, I think Trent Forrest is pretty decent. Aaron Holiday is better than Trent Forrest. And I don't know why they didn't just give Aaron those minutes. Maybe he wasn't, like, fresh enough to play all those minutes together. But I thought Forrest was fine. He had three assists. He had two, he had two points. He was totally fine. Defensively, he couldn't fix everything. But asking him to play defense with Bogey and AJ on the perimeter is not going to work against Dame. So that's not really his fault. Anyway, it's very flammable defensively. There's no, there's no really way around that with AJ and, and Bogey playing together. But also, you kind of had to put those guys together to make up for the offense that Trent does not really give you. So no great options, but I would like, I would like to see Jalen on the floor in this contest. It was a little bit odd. The Hawks went to like a like kind of a full line change in the, in the middle of the second quarter. Um, Capella had this awesome stretch of offense rebounding in the second that was nice to see to keep the Hawks close. They tried to zone defensively, and it, it did not work really at all in this game. Not a lot of ball pressure for the Hawks along the way, and the Blazers were able to get, to get their stuff pretty easily offensively. There were there was also a a downright horrible call against DeAndre Hunter. Now I saw I thought some of the officiating critiques by the fan base tonight were a little bit over the top, but that call was legitimately horrible. And my friend Glenn Willis been on the show many times. Peter Hoops, Glenn's brain nearly broke on that call. It was just one of those in real time. You kind of see uh, the meltdown happening. It was a horrible call on DeAndre Hunter. Um, still, defensively, didn't get really much better at all in the second quarter. Offense though was really good in the second quarter. They scored 37 points. They had nine offensive rebounds in a single quarter, and they were done by four at the half. Despite some porous offense, they were uh, certainly getting up a lot of uh, a lot of long twos as they have been for a while now. But Murray had 20 in the first half. And defensively, it was uh, kind of a mess along the way, as it was the entire way. So in the third quarter, it was an interesting decision that got some got some discussions. So Nate McMillan challenged a three-shot foul against Aaron Holiday pretty early in the third quarter. And I'll stop there. Nate usually waits and waits and sometimes overweights to use his challenges until the very, very end of the game, as some coaches do. But the way that I have kind of studied this and kind of heard around the league is that uh, even the most conservative coaches – the thing, that the thing that they actually are willing to challenge earlier is a three-shot foul that clearly was the wrong call. And this is a situation where it was a three-shot foul, so it's a high-leverage play. Obviously, you can't really get more high leverage than a three-shot foul. Maybe if it was a four-point play opportunity that was also like an offensive foul or something like that. But generally speaking, one of the more high-leverage plays you can have is a, three, is a three-shot foul that shouldn't have been a three-shot three foul. And that happened in this game. That was a very clear missed call. Nate probably saw the replay and wanted to overturn it, and it, it was successful. So I don't mind that. I th- in fact, I probably encourage it. It's a three-shot foul. I usually do not like burning challenges on low-leverage plays. This is not a low-leverage play. Though. It's a th- three-shot foul, and um, you know the impact there was interesting. There was a debate about that. I get all sides of it because usually you want to wait a little bit longer until the more high-leverage play happens. But generally, uh, that's a huge leverage play in the game. It's, it's just three points off the board. So that I, w- I was okay with that move. Uh, DeJounte had a wild finish on a fast break. That actually made the national rounds even for a highlight. That was a, it was a cool play by DeJounte in the middle of the third quarter. But later in the quarter, he got a T. Um, he actually was arguing a foul call against – that actually went against A.J. Griffin against Danny Lillard, and that ended up being a three-point possession for the, for the Blazers. The Hawks were down – this is a crazy stat that I was actually keeping up through, throughout the game. The Hawks were down by between four points and nine points, a pretty narrow range. That's a five-point range between four and nine. They were down by that much for 23 consecutive minutes – of this game. So generally every time the Hawks would make a shot or two, the Blazers would counter with a shot or two of their own. It was in that range for essentially an entire half of basketball, not perfectly the half, but 23 minutes of time. That is a crazy number. Um, That finally ended with bogey making a three with about nine seconds left in the third quarter. But even then Portland immediately hit two threes in a row and it was back up to that number. So uh, that even, even went even longer. I think they went almost like 30 minutes between two and 10. So it was just, uh, the Hawks were just down by single digits for pretty much the balance of the game. Kind of crazy. Um, down seven in the end of the third quarter, Jante had a 31 through three, but the Hawks just kept scoring and kept scoring and kept scoring and kept not getting stops along the way. Rotationally, also I should say, was basically the same in both halves. The Hawks did end up closing with the starters plus bogey in place of Aaron Holiday. 
I know that Hawks fans would rather see Griffin. We'll come back to that later on. I thought that was okay to go with Bogey in that spot. Um, I get it on all sides. Um, they were down by 10, though, pretty quickly in the fourth quarter. They did uh, you know, kind of bounce back from there. They were on the ropes after a three by Anthony, Anthony Simons with about six minutes to go down by eight. But Bogey had a tough three. Uh, that was a, a big, big shot with about 320 to go that I think people have kind of forgotten about. It was a really tough one, too. It was a bad possession, honestly, for everybody involved. Jante got, kind of got stalled at the top of the key, kicked it to Bogey, who made a three. And uh, that pulled the Hawks back within five with 320 to go. And out of a timeout, the Blazers didn't score. Um, and it's kind of back and forth, back and forth. Jeremy Grant missed a three. That was a good look to leave the door open for the Hawks. And then DeJounte drew a three-shot foul with 137 to go in the game. He made them all. Credit to him for that. And it was back to a two-point game. So that, at that point, you are right there. Down two, minute and a half to go. Uh, then they forced a miss from, from Simons. And Murray got to the line again and tied the game with a minute and six seconds left. Only the second tie of the entire game for Atlanta. So it was an 8-0 run there. Hawks were down by eight. Then it was the three, three by bogey. And then five figures in a row by DeJounte. Uh, then Dame did get to, the, uh, get, get to the rim very easily right after that. But then Murray got to the line again. One-on-one with, with Damian Lillard. Drew the whistle, about 40 seconds to go. I will say, I don't think that was a foul to, in real time. No, but it wasn't terrible at all. It was uh, Portland challenged the call unsuccessfully, and I actually agree with that interpretation. I think if you call it a foul on the court, there was not enough to overturn that. I think it was, probably wasn't a foul. It was a nice little break for the Hawks. But overall, the Hawks didn't have uh, didn't get a great whistle in this game, so I think they probably earned one along the way. Uh, DeJounte miss, uh, sorry, makes both free throws, and he made seven free throws in essentially a minute of time. That's pretty impressive um, to tie the game again. But then Simon's hit a huge shot, probably the biggest shot of the game. Honestly, you could go by three with 34 seconds to go. That forced a timeout from the Hawks. And then Bogey got fouled on a three. It was actually another great break. It was the fourth straight trip where the Hawks got fouled and went to the line. But unfortunately, uh, and by the way, this was not a controversial call at all. He hit, he hit his elbow pretty clearly. But Bogey missed two out of three. And that was bad timing. Bogey's been a great free throw shooter this year. In fact, kind of a weird number here. The Hawks shot 80% of the line in the game, but Collins missed four free throws. He's an 80% free throw shooter. And then Bogey missed the two at the very end. He's 81%. So two really good free throw shooters combined to miss uh, six attempts. And that was, those were all six that were missing the game. And uh, just kind of a weird uh, hiccup along the way there for Atlanta. And they had to foul. Obviously, down by uh, down by two still. They had to give two fouls in a row, actually, because they had one to give. And Jeremy Grant made both. Um, the Hawks had one more last gaps chance when Bogey made a three down five in the final seconds, but then they had to foul again. Dame was the guy that had to foul. He made both, and that was the end of that. So, uh, obviously, it was not perfect. It was kind of the same frustrating, also encouraging, also valiant effort run the entire game because the Hawks were just right there but not all the way close. They got down to a tie game down the stretch. And they never led in the second half. That's notable. Um, but uh, yeah, they were just battling and battling and battling. And they could have rolled over a few times and they never and they never did. But Portland just kept countering every time with big shots from Dame or big shots from Simons or whoever. And uh, that was the story of the second half and really the entire way. So we'll get back into the individual players in a second. But uh, again, as a reminder, an offense, an offense first game for sure. And defensive, defensively, the Blazers had trouble. The Hawks had trouble. And uh, the home team won at the very end. Okay, we'll get into the players in a second. But first, a word from our sponsors on the podcast today. All right, and playing to get to here on the player-by-player player evaluations. Only nine guys appeared for Atlanta. I already did my rant about Jalen Johnson not playing. I will do it one more time. He should have played in this game. That's my full-stop opinion at this point in time. Uh, Trent Forrest, two points, uh, three assists, two rebounds, took one shot and made it, uh, two turnovers. I thought Trent was okay. He wasn't great. It, he's even less of a offensive initiator than Aaron Holiday, which is hard to do. So those two guys probably could have played combined minutes and just been Aaron, but you know, not really Trent Forrest's fault by any means. Akong was pretty quiet. He had eight points and seven rebounds. Good job on the glass in this game. Made all four of his shots. He played fine. Um, Edgy Griffin had a couple of encouraging moments, hit three threes, as he often does. Um, no assist, though. Uh, one rebound for AJ in 21 minutes. Defensively, he had some trouble, as most guys did on the perimeter in this game, but I thought he gave them good minutes when he was out there. And this is going to be controversial. I think people have kind of turned on Bogey, and I get why, because he's not been very good this year, full stop. His defense is a problem at this point. He is physically limited in a way that is notable to me. And also, he has the unpleasant reality of standing in the way, quote-unquote, of AJ Griffin. And, you know, anytime there's a young, exciting rookie, Hawks fans or any fans going to kind of lean in that direction. So it's a confluence of things. I'll say this. This might be controversial again. I think Bogey played pretty well in this game. Uh, defensively, 
again, it, it was a mess for almost everyone involved. Um, all the perimeter guys, with the exception of kind of Holiday and Forrest. But, um, you know, DeJounte was pretty bad, I thought, defensively. AJ was pretty bad defensively. Bogey was pretty bad defensively. Uh, even Hunter was below average for him in this game. But offensively, like, Bogey did a pretty good job. Obviously, he missed two free, two free throws at the end. That's going to stand out. I understand that. But 23 points. Uh, that was number two on the team. Seven assists, which was tied for the team lead. Uh, he was four of ten on threes. That's hugely valuable. He was three of six on twos. That's totally fine. That's a line of seven attempts. I think he was a very useful offensive player in this game. Defensively, again, not great. But uh, this is one where I actually didn't mind them going with Bogey down the stretch. Um, first of all, they were losing. So I think going with Bogey or Griffin would have been fine. And listen, I'm not saying they had to go with Bogey. They could have they gone with AJ. In fact, I had a note on my notes where they actually came out of the timeout with like six minutes to go with AJ in that spot. But then after that, they went back to bogey. So I would have been fine either way. I'm not saying or, or the opposite there, but I think that it was also fine with me to play bogey down the stretch there because he gave them a lot of offense when they kind of had to have it with uh, DeJounte basically be the only guy who can get his own shot in the lineup. All right, uh, to the starters. Aaron Holiday, quiet, three points on two shots, one assist, one turnover, uh, again, I didn't mind him starting, but he's just he's not a great offensive player. He can shoot it, but he was not like effective necessarily um, as a guy getting guarded. Didn't have a quick trigger offensively, and the ball handling is the ball handling. So actually, why he, he might have played more if it was me, but uh, it is what it is at this point. Uh, we'll come back to Dejounte at the end just for one more time because I know we talked about him earlier. But uh, DeAndre Hunter has been struggling offensively. So last two games after he missed the two games, of course, he is seven of twenty-seven from the floor. In those two games, he was three of 14 tonight, um, 0 of four on threes, three of 10 on twos. That's tough. Uh, one assist, two turnovers, two rebounds for Hunter, kind of a kind of a throwback Hunter stat line other, other than the bad shooting. He wasn't great here at all defensively. I don't think he was his, his best either. So uh, a blow average game for sure for him. He's got to make more, make more shots in the near future for the Hawks to get where they have to be. Uh, Capella, I thought, played well, 10 points, 15 rebounds, three assists. Um, didn't make his shots around the rim, and that kind of led to a bunch of office rebounds in this game for Capella. But uh, in general, I thought he was effective. Um, wasn't like great, but certainly was okay along the way. And then Collins had a very typical recent Collins game. He had a good first quarter. The Hawks stopped featuring him as uh, sort of in maddening fashion, as I've said a number of times this year. He ends up with 16.6 rebounds, played fine. Um, the free throws were weird. Two of six there is very strange for him, but – Looking beyond that, he had five fouls, but like defensively, he was at least being engaged. Um, I thought he played like a solidly average game for him. It wasn't great, nor was he bad. And then DeJounte, again, was just borderline awesome. I'm not, not even borderline. He was just awesome in this game. Uh, defensively, you could nitpick it, as I probably have earlier in the earlier in the podcast. He's not great on the ball at all, but offensively, he carried a huge workload effectively. I will say, though, the Hawks were minus four with him, and actually they managed to tread water without him. I would have been surprised by that if I didn't see the box score on this game. I thought, I thought DeJounte played 38 minutes. The Hawks are definitely not holding back on minutes. You know, Nate, I'm sure, feels the heat at this point. But playing Collins, Hunter, and Murray all 38 minutes on the first night of a, of a long road trip isn't ideal, I would say. But at least the game was competitive the entire way, so there was a, it was at least a reason to push the game. Uh, but alas, that's what happened at the, at the very, very end of this one. Um, that's all I have for this game in particular. Again, we talked about it before, but the Hawks are now below 500 for the season. They are 12-15 and 15 on the road. They have a, a really tough stretch coming up still that included this game. The first game after this comes up on Wednesday in Phoenix. That's the second game of a five-game trip. The deadline looms at the end of the trip, and uh, the schedule is not any more forgiving. Now, the Suns are not playing fantastic basketball in recent days. They have had injury issues along the way. They have now won, I believe, uh, six of the last seven. Before uh, that, came, that comes out on the heels of like the, a pretty brutal stretch for them. Um you know, they have talent still, but uh, I believe Devin Booker's played in only like, yeah, 29 games this year. So the Suns are a challenging evaluation, but they have to go there. That's never going to be easy at all. And then after that, it's Utah, it's Denver in an impossible spot on Saturday, and then it's New Orleans. So no gimmies on this road trip by any means. Now they're 0-1. Uh, I think I said this before the trip even started, but if they go 2-3, and that'd be a success in my mind. Uh, worse than that is certainly on the table. I think the Hawks will be underdogs on Wednesday, even with Trey, if he if he's able to play. So uh, nothing's going to be uh, very, very easy to navigate there. We'll have more podcast content later in the week. I don't know when exactly yet. At the very latest, it will be after the game on Wednesday. The best thing you can possibly do to support the podcast is to subscribe to the show across platforms. Apple, Spotify, Stitcher, YouTube, all those places. Please follow the show on Twitter at Lots on Hawks. Follow me on Twitter at BT Rowan. Subscribe to my Patreon. 
patreon.com slash BT Roland. Again, thank you for listening to the podcast, everybody. We'll be back in the near future and stay tuned for all of that. We'll see you next time.